because of this trust of silence cult, it's, it's kind of birthed this mindset of distrust everything. It can be a good mindset, but only if you can remain objective. You know, seeing everything as a lie is just as bad as taking everything as truth. They're both extremes. What inspired you to start making the series and the videos that you did? My sort of, you know, snap out of the mainstream was a long time ago, with, mainly with health-related stuff. But as the pandemic began, I knew something wasn't right very quickly. I came here from a, you know, it's, it's to do with the money, the banks, they want, they want to reset that. I didn't get anyone to listen to me. No, no one. I started sending them other videos on other topics, just, just to foster some kind of mentality in them that, you know, perhaps we're not being told the truth. It wasn't working. So I thought, okay, I'm going to make my own videos. I'd never made any before. But my viewpoint was that, you know, if I'm making it, you have to listen. So family and friends, they did. And it didn't work on all of them. Maybe, I don't know. 10% maybe. A lot of them have gone on to get the jab and stuff. So I consider it a big failure. But all they were supposed to be were the, the original Flat Earth one and then the Tartaria one was just a collection, a summary that was of all the sort of arguments and research and a sort of um, springboard so they could continue down that path if they wanted to um, and try to present it in a, you know, a fun way. I think I got a little bit carried away with the narrative. You know, I like writing and I wanted to make... The, my key objective was to sort of hook the viewer. You were definitely successful there. <laughs> yeah. But I did have... I mean, I fell for it. It's like it does draw you in. But, I mean, I love looking at the old photographs, you know, so... It's just one of those, those things you can sink your time into. And soon after I released it, it, it started to click that it was wrong. With topics like Flat Earth and other conspiracies, it, there's no real harm there. I mean, the biggest harm is you're probably offending a lot of the scientific community that have spent years and years pouring research and time into things. And okay, that's fine. But with history, I think it, it comes with different risks and I wasn't comfortable with the claims that I put out there, the one world civilization, we didn't do this. I think what happens is if you create a massive historical absence, the mind of you and anyone you're talking to about it will instantly try and replace that absence with something else, you know, a replacement narrative. So, oh, if we didn't build them, then who did? And that's where this conspiracy theory becomes very dangerous because although it might not have started out as a, you know, a, a PSYOP, you know, the CIA and things like that, but it doesn't stop someone in the future taking it and capitalizing on it and inserting replacement narratives that come with, you know, a whole host of ideologies, whether it's race, whether it's politics, whatever it could be. And I just wasn't comfortable with leaving it there. I wanted to, you know, give people something else that, you know, is in line with where, where my thinking's at now and an alternative way of looking at it, because I just think getting stuck down that rabbit hole, there's so many problems with eradicating big portions of history, whether it's the, you know, the child slavery, the child labor, slavery in general. There's a lot that comes with it. It's a heavy topic, I think. I always go back to Planet X because I was one of these people who really fell for that. I was watching videos, allegedly, from South America New Zealand of this second son coming up. And I remember having dinner with my parents one night after watching one of these videos. And, you know, I had to be like probably 16. And I'm just like looking at them. We're sitting around the table and I just, I feel Planet X coming. And I'm like, <laughs> this is it. Like, these are the last little moments that we're going to have together. And everything after this, it changes. And I don't know if we're going to survive this. And it felt really heavy. Obviously, 2012 rolls around none of that stuff comes to fruition. So since that one, I always kept a little more of an open mind. So when I started going down the Tartaria route, which was the beginning of my channel, I came into it skeptical from the get go. And one of the first things that I was covering was McKim, Mead and White, because I was looking at, okay, what are what are all these channels talking about? And what are they not talking about? And I felt like there wasn't 
a lot of attention given to who the architects or the credited architects for these projects. So I figured if there's a loophole, it's going to be in there. Stanford White was murdered because he was like a pedophile, murdered by one of the, you know, the billionaires of the world who was upset from a, a rape he had done in the past. You know, it was getting exciting. And in researching McKimmina White, I came across the Dewey Arches, which were said to be these temporary arches in Madison Square Park in New York City. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh my gosh, there's so much truth to this hidden history, to this Tartaria thing. So I had to kind of put that aside, but I did bring it up in the video that I was working on at the time. I was like, look what I found. I'm going to circle back on this and it's going to be great. And as soon as I started looking into those Dewey arches, it was very clear that those things were temporary. I found photo after photo of them mashed up on the streets. You could see the plaster ripped off. And then I also had to like come onto my channel and present it because I was all excited about it one minute and now I have to be like, so just FYI, I don't think this actually was legit anymore. I do think it was, was temporary. Going further down the rabbit hole, I was doing a video on the, I think it was Charlottesville. It was one of these world fairs in either South Carolina or North Carolina. And I found the same statues present at this world's fair that were on the Dewey Arch. And they were very specific. They were these like war soldiers and cannons, you know, cannons on a gunship. And once I saw those, that's when it really started to ring the bells that it's like, these are clearly molds. But I was already so invested in the community at that point. You know, the channel was growing. I was enjoying it. So I didn't want to disappoint people, but I just kept seeing video after video after video stuff that was really taking me backwards to the point where finally I had to do the pivot. Did you get a lot of backlash and how was your viewers on that? That video, when I first did my major pivot, I didn't look at it for like 24 hours. I right. just walked away because I was like, oh, this is going to be bad. And when I came to it, it had like a 93% average. And I was like, oh, Oh, that's not bad at all. And then I went into the comments and there definitely wasn't a 93%. So naturally the people who were the most upset by it or the most vocal in kind of a negative way, they were populating the comments quite a lot. And yeah, it was a lot of insults from people that you recognized because in previous videos they were like, we love you. You know, either the conspiracies that you've been got to or you're not strong enough to be able to go down, you know, this path. And that kind of triggers you because like, what? Like not strong enough. What the fuck does that mean? Like, <laughs> it was very difficult to ignore those individuals, but I, I, I did try. And then the more I kept releasing videos of where I was at and the more I would see these insulting comments come through, it finally did get to me. Everyone loved it when I was being a sarcastic jerk towards the mainstream. But then I had to turn it towards these trolls. And looking backwards, I don't think that that was the right approach to go about it, but it felt natural in the moment. The comment section is an interesting one. I mean, it does get to me a little bit now and then, but I think I've, I've got into a habit of actually replying to a lot of people now. And I, I mean, I don't really take things personally. I can't say I appreciate some of the attacks. The, um, I mean... It, most of it's just been you're a shill. <laughs> I mean, that's fine. But I think it's a little bit disappointing in some ways because it, it does show you how far people are down into this rabbit hole and that perhaps they're not coming back. And I suppose the, the only real reason we all got into this stuff in the first place was to just exercise critical thinking. But it just doesn't really feel that way anymore for a lot, of, you know, in terms of the comments I receive. Did you get any stick from other channels? when you pivoted? Right. People didn't want anything to do with me anymore. It was like no <laughs> more talking with these individuals, no more being friends. I did take that as kind of like a red flag. And I think that just kind of goes back to how for a lot of these people, and maybe this is a taboo subject, this is a career for them. And mm -hmm. it's, it's not a lucrative one. You got to be making 300,000 views a week and releasing videos a week to really have a successful 
stable career on YouTube. And none of these guys have that. You're getting views all right. But I feel like it's just enough to kind of get by. The channels have always been a bit of a problem with me anyway, because I've never really had a relationship with them. Never really spoke to any of them, really. But before, you know, said, like, no, I've got this wrong. It's not right. A lot of them would actually, you know, they'd talk about my stuff, but they'd, they'd say that it's disclosure or that, you know, maybe I'm a mason and things like that. So all this chit chat was always there to begin with. So I think I've just gotten used to it. Ramo, I don't know how to pronounce her name, but she said that I'm, I'm the Jesuit trying to discredit her work. And it was, it was like that before and it's like that now. So I've kind of got used to that. But there is space on YouTube for multiple um, viewpoints on this subject, on history for sure. So I, I don't really see why it's such a big deal. Well, that's why I don't go the route of people or shills, because as you said, YouTube is a big enough space. There's enough confusion already there with everyone and their ideas that you don't need to throw in an agent to confuse it. It's confusing on its own. Exactly. Um, on the topic of EWAR and conspiracies, I think it's only appropriate that we bring up some of the ones on you. I found myself on FPV's channel and he's linking you to this guy, Elijah Castle. So I go to Elijah Castle's videos and I'm like, okay, I can see where he might get the idea because you guys have a similar ish accent. But then Elijah Castle has like a three hour long video where he's saying he knows who your real identity is. I'm scrolling through the video trying to find it because I'm like, when is he going to reveal who you are? And naturally, I didn't find it because I could not sit there and watch the whole video and I wasn't able to catch it skimming through. It's been a bit of a ball ache from the start, to be honest. Where this Elijah drama came from, I don't really know. But the guy did reach out to me. And he said, can you, can you put them straight? And I just said, I am not. But then they, they, they wanted me to go into their little hangouts and show my face and all this stuff. And I thought, hey, you know what? I'm not going to tolerate this. I just got away. This guy, again, I can't pronounce his surname, but Ryan Zem or something like that, he started selling DVDs of my series. I told him not to do it. Um, he didn't think there was anything wrong in that, which <laughs> there was a lot wrong in that. Um, but then I like, yeah, so Elijah thought that was, that was the real Iwan. Um, it was just a big farce. And I just got the hump from it. You know, it was just exhausting. It's, every time you go on YouTube, there's some new drama. So I, I did step back for a bit. And it kind of, I think it stopped, I think. I mean, I still get the occasional comment, call me Elijah. <laughs> it's quite funny. But um, yeah, it's just bizarre. It's a bizarre place though, isn't it, YouTube? I saw a channel the other day, someone had opened a channel called Baby Ewa. I mean, it made me laugh. The most that I'm getting now is just, you know, that he's flipped. He's a flip flopper. Um, he's had a talking to from, you know, the controllers. And a lot of people have said, you know, like, aren't you scared of losing the followers and stuff? But I have lost a lot of followers. I'm quite happy with that. I mean, I, I mean, maybe they'll come back and maybe they won't. But I, I think I like the idea of actually being a small channel where we can actually just discuss in the comment section the topic at hand. This is another problem I'm having actually at the minute. It's a, And this is, again, it's, it's not a, a criticism of, well, I suppose it is a bit of a criticism of the community or part of the community, the mindset. And I think it's constructive criticism, but there is a lot of moving of the goalposts. So I'll put out a video on brick making in the 1800s. And a lot of people come through and say, what about the pyramids? And so I'm like, okay, this isn't about the pyramids. And I, I try and answer as many questions as I can, but now it's got to the point where I'm getting comments saying, look, you don't understand. This is one thing making bricks, but it, it goes a lot deeper than that. What did they do for water? What did they eat for lunch while they're making these bricks? So now I'm in a position where... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to start putting out videos on Victorian packed lunches. This is a, the whole thing as well with this, this YouTube business. Is, uh, you know, people said to me, like, oh, you know, your videos are not as good as they were before. But these videos take so long to make. I mean, I'm, no, I'm not an expert on it at all in terms of the editing and things like that. I, you know, going forward, it's going to have to be short stuff. It, it's too time consuming, especially for the reward, you know, in terms of, you know, a lot of backlash and some nice comments is not really paying out. Because a lot of people, they do ask good questions in the comments. And I don't want to just put out stuff and not engage. I do feel a bit 
you know, like I owe it to some people to comment back. This artificial stone's becoming a little bit of an obsession of mine now because for a long time it was looking at black and white photographs of world spares and things like that. And then, you know, mentioning some construction photos and saying, no, they're fake. And I think the answer, well, not necessarily the answer, but a, a way into this is that, well, has, how, you know, liberal or, you know, how free have they been in using these sort of pseudo stonemasonry techniques to potentially fabricate a bit of history? You know, I'm thinking about the Indian stuff um, while the British were out there. So one of the challenges I'm having at the minute is that I would like to try and find a word for this, <laughs> you know, that can almost not match Tartaria, but at least can offer people a, a way of just, you know, calling it something different that you can put to that sort of approach of looking at, you know, historical fabrication and architecture. But from that perspective, you know, in terms of well, what's been changed, because now construction is possible, opens up a whole, whole different sort of... Um, avenue of looking at it but I, I do need a word i can't can't follow maybe i'm just having a bit of a creative slog at the minute nah, that something like that would definitely need to just come naturally and you're not alone static in the attic is uh had the same conversation with me Good, yeah i don't i don't think it's going to come to me anytime soon anyway <laughs> You probably don't be, want to be the one that starts it because then you'll <laughs> be considered like the front runner of it. I don't want that. <laughs> it's too much. <laughs> You're the first person that I've actually sort of ever spoken to. And like you said, we've, we share similar stories. So it's, um, yeah, it's refreshing. And that's, that's just been one of the best things about this is that, you know, when I released that pivot, it was very overwhelming in the sense of the reaction but then, you know, you came through, you, you commented and I checked out your channel and thought, oh my God, there, there are other people that have been through this and come back. Yeah, I'm always going to be pro-conspiracy and I don't care how crazy it is, I'll listen to it. But as you've said, you know, I got involved with one of them that I just, I did have to clear the record for myself. I wasn't doing the proper research and I wanted to correct it. And people always are like, why don't you just do videos on what you are into? And it's like, that's just it. I'm, I'm an empty vessel right now. I've, I don't have time to research anything. I was starting to get into the situation in Ukraine and I did two videos on that, but that felt like such a different territory. And one of the people that I even featured in one of my videos, Coach Redpill, I think is his name. He's been disappeared. I don't know if he's been located. He was in Ukraine speaking his mind and one of these major news corporations over here brought up to Zelensky and his regime and made it known, hey, you've got this guy over here like talking major shit on you. And he's been missing. He hasn't posted videos. It was mainstream news that he was missing. Yeah, I totally understand why people don't trust the mainstream. We're seeing the lies in real time. I fully support people questioning history. And I think that's just it is maybe it's time that the gates of Tartaria come down and people push further past that because it does feel like a facade. You don't want to stop there because on the other side of that wall is, is just wood and plaster, literally. That's well said. Yeah. <laughs> All I really care about at the minute is, you know, just reading as much as I can, getting out like I am, um, and just, you know, enjoying this, trying to find um, a way of presenting this the sort of alternative historical conspiracies um, I've become into. That's the one blessing that's come from Tartaria is that I'm now just a geek for architecture. And that's why I do note the positives for me in Tartaria because it did open my mind in a way it needed to open. And now I really do have a lot of respect and admiration for architecture. It's criticism from a decent place. So he mentions you, Static in the Attic, and Ewar. You guys are actually causing more damage than good, in my opinion. Because remember what this is all about, cultivating curiosity. You have a condescending tone towards those that somewhat fell for Tartaria. That's your guys' brand now. You do know that, right? Your audience is people who doubt the Tartaria theory, but not only that, they are tired of it. You are cultivating fear, doubt, and not only that, you are training people to believe in the mainstream narrative, which now I think is actually indirect. You may not realize what you're doing. Where I give empathy to this statement 
is I've seen comments come through where people are like, I'm so stupid. How did I fall for this? Like all this time wasted. And anytime I see those comments, I always jump in because I don't want to see people talking down on themselves. You know, I, I'm doing that all the time with me. And I know I shouldn't be because I don't think it was a waste of time. This is something that you've kind of been doing. So I'm going to take a moment to do the same is you've been showing how you're getting information. And this happened to me recently. I was on a job and our boss wanted floor plans for this housing project in New York City. Red bricks, a whole bunch of these buildings and built in the 1950s. And we got to get floor plans for them. So we look on the internet and there's nothing. So we come to this DOB now, submit filings, payments, and requests to the New York City Department of Buildings. And this is the page. And the way you find stuff is through either this or these bin numbers, which the bin numbers is actually the better way to go. But in order to even use this web page, you need these guidelines and they tell you how you find these BIS numbers and these bin numbers. And essentially all the floor plans, construction plans, blueprints for every New York City building is stored here. Finding what you're looking for isn't even easy. So once you're in here, there's all these different bins. You're trying to locate just reading files. And when you think you found what you want, you send this into them. And like 24 to 48 hours later, you get an email saying they're ready for you to come view in person. So we send our production assistant and she goes to the building and they're $8 a scan. Oh, wow, and yeah. we get... She chooses the ones that we needed. We specifically were looking for just overhead ground plans of this building. So there were tons of them she had to go through and she found the ones that our boss wanted and the whole thing was a success. So the reason I even bring all this up is because going back to that comment about how you're training people to believe in the mainstream. There are so many of the content creators out there and even the comments that just say this stuff doesn't exist. There's no blueprints. And this is where I think the mainstream is a good thing because you can look into this stuff and, and you can find it. And that's not to say that the information is real. Sure, it could all be faked at the end of the day. I don't know. But it's that not trying, not looking hard enough. It's like you have to be there. You have to go in and they give you the microfilm. I was asking my production assistant all about it. I'm like, so what happened? What was it like? It's like, yeah, you sit down in a chair, someone kind of stands nearby. You're not allowed to pull your phone out. You can't take pictures because it costs $8 to get a scan of it. You got to bring a, a USB drive or they will print you something. So someone really could spend ages, you know, going through there. And that's where if there is any truth to the impossible architecture theory, it's going to be in these mainstream archives because you might get to one and the microfilm is just a child's drawing on crayon and then you can turn and be like what the fuck is this and then you might really be onto something but until someone presses the mainstream on those levels i can't go back to believing any of the stuff that's been presented and i would go through these archives myself except for i kind of already have the suspicion that what i'm going to be looking for is going to be there so it's probably best i don't present it because then it's just going to be more of wood nickels debunking tartaria videos and i don't want to do that anymore and the only yeah. reason i did the video on you was because of that video that autodidactic and tartaria australia did otherwise i would have never gone back i i made it point in my head i'm not going backwards i'm not gonna make myself a target and go to battle with this group. But when I sat through that video and I didn't know that they were gonna do that because Campbell had shared your video of the pivot on his channel. And I was in his comments like, thank you for doing this. Like, this is so great that, you know, we can have these conversations <laughs> and you're getting this info out. And then their video came out and I was just like, what? <laughs> you know, it's like more like creating conspiracies on you kind of. And then just so much of what was being said, I was like, I have to say something now. It only makes sense that I would say something. So otherwise I would have kept my mouth shut. Uh, yeah, I, I just felt I'm not going to, I'm not going to respond to this one. Um, <laughs> there's been many, I can't respond to all of them. And, you know, if I do, if I do like, you know, with the, the levy drop that in the, in the bricks video, it's, yeah, I get people saying like, don't attack him. And it's not an attack of John Levy. It's, it's a criticism because 
I feel like there does need to be more transparency for the viewer's sake in terms of these photos do exist. They do. There's a, there's a wealth of information. You know, maybe something good will come out of it. Maybe not. Um, and, I, you know, I welcome the criticism as well. I get, I get a lot of it. So, and sometimes it's really good. And that's one thing that I find incredibly refreshing about your work is I've always wanted to see someone come into this who kind of has more of the investigative journalist mindset and really does the homework. And you're going in and you're pulling out all this stuff that really should have been involved in this research at the start of it, but it wasn't. So it's coming in now and it's almost it's coming in too late because the train's already left the station. People are on board with this idea. And I totally understand because we do need to be questioning history. No, I completely agree with you. I get comments like this all the time and I say, you know, we've got kettles, we have cookers, airplanes, we've seen the documentation from the start to the finish, from the early models to the later models, it, it will all one day be archived. So to say that everything in the narrative, that's what, you know, people say that the historical narrative is a lie. The na- it depends on what they're saying the narrative is. And you've got your canonical history, you've got, you know, the real mainstream, the Dan Jones, and you've got historical revisionism that's going on. But not everything is a lie. The problem I have with this, and I'm, I'm guilty of this because I put out a series that promoted this. I've damaged the whole thing. That's the way I feel anyway. And now I feel like, okay, I need to present something alternative to show that it's not, you know, not everything is a lie. But one thing that the Tartaria, you know, advocates, community, they are fully taking advantage, I feel anyway, of our sort of present era of lost trust. You know, because of this trust of science cult, it's, it's kind of birthed this mindset of distrust everything. Everything is a lie. It can be a good mindset, but only if you can remain objective. When it gets out of hand and then you're so far down this rabbit hole that you can't come out, then it's dangerous. And it's, you know, seeing everything as a lie is just as bad as taking everything as truth. They're both extremes. And like you said, there's plans. I mean, that's a great resource. I wonder how far those buildings go back in terms of their catalogue. It does help go into these places because once you start seeing the, the artificial stone, you know, the pseudo stone, and the way these things are, you, you instantly know that something's wrong with that hypothesis of it belonging to an advanced civilization. There's also a danger of fostering too much curiosity. And I think it comes back to that idea that everything is a lie. There needs to be an in-between. And I think that's what I'm trying to do. I think that latest video I put out, I'm trying to get people excited of, you know, about a different way of approaching things. It might not be correct. It's just a hypothesis. Um, it's just something that I've formulated from the stuff I've been looking into. So we'll see how that goes. But I think there are other ways of approaching this that, you know, it doesn't mean you're going back to the Dan Jones history. And it doesn't mean that you're going full-blown radical in, and, you know, believe in a 19th century reset. With Tartaria, it had a good couple years where it was just out there on its own. So there wasn't much critiquing of it in the beginning, where now it kind of is boiling more to the surface. So it will be going under more scrutiny uh, from different sources. And at that point, most of the people will probably be like, oh, this is an attack. This is a, you know, this is a psyop on us, which I would disagree with. I think it does deserve all the the criticism needed. I think your videos are great. I've enjoyed watching them. Um, I did a bit of a binge watch and um, same with Static. I think they're both great. And I think it's a shame actually because a lot of the stuff there is really worth looking into and, you know, what Static's saying about, you know, cataclysms in the Middle Ages and stuff. I, I think people have overlooked that and I think it's really worth looking into. So I got some criticism for the video I put together with Static. He was really prepared to talk on a lot of that stuff, and he did. And as soon as he started talking about that stuff, the video quality became horrible. The audio was dropping in and out, and I didn't want to interrupt him at all during it, but he went on for like a solid hour presenting where he's at in his research. And he really wanted that to be the core of the video having a slight background in film, I was just like, I can't use this because the quality is driving me crazy. 
And it took me a really long time to put the video together. And finally, when I put the video out, it was essentially, you know, against the Tartaria video. And, and someone who, who's a huge fan of Static reached out to me and was like, I got to admit, I was a little disappointed in that. I thought he was going to go into where he's at. And I'm like, he did. So he probably, he himself probably doesn't really like the video that I put out. I wouldn't blame him. It was just an unfortunate series of events. I would have liked to have had more of what he wanted to talk about, but instead it became, it became what it, what it was. Truth is a shattered mirror. And it's going to take all of us to pick those pieces up and put them back together. And I think right now, if we could actually get a visual on how the mirror looks, it probably looks like shit. And we're doing a pretty good, bad job. Like some pieces are kind of going together. And then there's just other pieces like, well, no, that doesn't belong there. And that person's like, no, no, that piece is stained. You're not moving that piece. That, that one's right. And it's like, okay. So that piece is now stained, even though it doesn't fit there. And, and maybe we're not supposed to put the mirror back together. Maybe we're actually supposed to leave it shattered and, and walk away. And in some point in the future, this will all make sense why this happened and we got reset and we don't know our true history and it will be a good thing. And it was supposed to happen this way. Yeah. I like that as well. Broken mirror. It's not black mirror anymore. It's blue, broken mirror. <laughs> it's a broken black mirror. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, babe, but I probably have to leave it there because I've got to go out and sounds good shopping and all kinds of stuff, but we should do these more often. Actually, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, chat whenever really perhaps even do like you know a short little research video together that would probably be better for me because then it's like in school when you get into groups you always want to get in the group with the person who does the most homework because then you don't have to do it so <laughs> I could just stand behind you and just be championing like yeah keep going go <laughs> <laughs> no i think we should do that i think we should definitely um i'm definitely up for yeah sharing some screens and i can present you some stuff and where my thinking's at and definitely mate. take care yeah Yep, best to you and, and yours and um, talk soon. Bye.